Hello and welcome to Scribes and Songsters. I'm Veronique Mandel. Fall in North America hails the beginning of baseball playoffs from Little League to the MLB. Tonight, we talk to two authors who were once diehard baseball fans, loyally supporting their beloved Detroit Tigers. But the game had lost its spark, and in 2017, Heidi and Dale Jacobs decided not to renew their Tiger season tickets. That was a curveball they'd never anticipated. An idea to spend their summer immersed in baseball and co-author a book about the experience was seen as a way to renew their love for the game. So in 2018, Heidi and Dale drew a 100-mile radius around their home in Windsor. They plotted out 50 games they would attend between the end of March and Labor Day. They would watch various levels of competition, including Major League, NCAA, and high school. All told, they would end up driving just under 3,000 miles. From watching foul balls to shivering on the stands in foul weather, they explored the nuances of the game from a spectator's perspective. Heidi and Dale are on deck here in the studio to talk about their book, 100 Miles of Baseball, 50 Games, One Summer. Welcome to you both. Thank you for Thanks having for us. Thanks for having us. Um, so, so I know how, you know, the, w why you decided, but at what point, um, can you sort of remember the moment where one of you said, let's do that? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I think it was probably Dale. We, uh, after we got rid of our season tickets, the next year we thought, well, wouldn't it be great to go to 27 games in the area? And then we did a couple and then we just sort of didn't because it got hot or it got rainy or yeah. whatever. And then sometime in February of 2018, I don't I think we were talking about not renewing our tickets again. And Dale said, well, what if we did 50 games in 100 miles? And then we thought, let's turn it into a book. And then once Bibli Oasis was interested in it, then, yeah. then the deal was done. And it was a bit of a shock. I remember walking away. We had we met Dan and our and our editor, Sharon, at uh, Anchor Coffee. And we were walking back to our car. And I said, what have we done? What have we done? <laughs> and, and the last meeting with them, they were interested in the book. And the last meeting we had with them was the day before we started going to games. So we signed the deal with them on the Thursday and started going to games on, on the Friday. We were at the Wayne State game on the Friday. Now, you plotted your radius, but did you decide which games you were going to first? Did you, you know, sort of have a, a roster? Sort of. We, we, we really couldn't because uh, the weather is such an unpredictable element, especially in in April, um, if you read the book, you'll yeah. you'll see how few games we actually made yeah. it to in April. So we had to be flexible. We tried to plan a week or two at a time. We had a few markers throughout. We knew we wanted to go to the elimination tournament. We knew we wanted to go to the to the under twenty one championships. But we had to be flexible and just see what games were up. And uh, if we heard about something, just go to it. And uh, it was yeah. a, a lot of logistics. And a lot of flexibility. I remember we showed up at one game and we were in the parking lot. There's nobody there. And we saw someone who was like, where's the game? And they said, there's no game on today. And so we like, okay, well, we're, what's next on our list? And so we ended yeah. up going to, uh, oh, that to, USPBL to Utica, game. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just constantly, you know, so being flexible. At, at a lot of the levels we saw teams would just wouldn't update the schedules and we did we had trouble getting good information sometimes so we really did have to be flexible because of that and the weather now had you gone to all levels of baseball before or were you just sort of like tigers level we'd gone to some i mean we'd certainly been to michigan to an ncaa game and we'd been to minor league games i had never gone to a high school game previously We'd some we'd seen some amateur baseball around here. Mm -hmm. We'd been to Woodsley before, and uh, we had been to historic baseball prior to this. So most of it, but uh, not in any sustained kind of way. Did you sit in a um, high school baseball game and be bored, or did you find it interesting? Were they good? There and, and this was a challenge of the 
the project, I wanted to find something interesting about every game that we went to. And so one of my things, if if I was bored, which I don't think I was, uh, I, it was my fault. I had to find something interesting. Yeah. And so it actually wasn't hard to find something interesting. Actually, that probably my problem was there was too much that was interesting about the conversations and what was going on in the field and things. Right. And for for the high school games or what what are called the midget major, the under 18 games, I was fascinated with the coaches and how they were, you know, dealing with these young players and helping them not only to be better at baseball, but to to learn how to be better people. And uh, the best coaches were clearly doing that. And it was fascinating to see the differences in styles of the coaches and the way the players were responding or not responding to them. Now, did the players and or the coaches or, or, or people in charge, did they know that you were there uh, doing this? I don't think no. anyone did. No, no. Um, some I knew someone who was playing on one of the games, but uh, yeah, it was very, very rare. A lot of times people thought we were co uh, scouts, which I thought was very strange, <laughs> you know, my little sundress and, and shoes. But um, yeah, or someone was wondering, someone lady asked me at the bathroom once, she said, are you writing in your diary? What are you writing? And yeah. I was like, oh, well, we're writing a book. So sometimes people would yeah. ask us questions because it was odd that we were both just sitting there and writing. So, uh, And we were outliers in so many situations. <laughs> you know, at, if we were at an NCAA game or especially high school or amateur, we were some of the only people who were there that weren't friends or family of the players. So often... We were kind of on the outside. There was, especially the Adrian tournament, the Division Three NCAA tournament, everyone kept asking us, who's your kid? Who are you here to see? Because they assumed we wouldn't be there otherwise. And and so some of the parents actually started asking us what we were doing. And and a few of them were, were quite intrigued by this idea of going around and watching baseball without this commitment to be there. Did you start to feel that passion rekindle as as you did this, or did it take some time? I think I, I started liking baseball, small b, large b, and realizing I liked the sport, um, hmm. and not necessarily the Tigers. I mean, I'm still sort of emotionally attached to them, but I, I started seeing many, many more nuances about the sport and how many uh, like I, I would often think wow all the players we saw at tigers games they started off like this they played in the rain they mm -hmm. played these long games and they sat waiting for rain delays and these really cruddy dugouts and what have you and and that's where they all started and i don't think if you just watch mlb you don't see all the road that they would have taken and all their parents that would have driven them to all those games and all of that. And I think it really made me understand um, all that's involved to becoming a pro baseball player and also how amazingly good they are. Um, they just make everything look so easy. And watching these games, you see how long it took people to develop mm. those skills and become really good. Certainly gave you a different perspective, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and a different appreciation. It's, it's interesting to hear you... Um, articulate that because I'm sure uh, you know there are lots of people who go to those games and they never think about what went before mm -hmm. what those players we you know when they were 10 years old and what they were doing mm -hmm. it's, yeah. uh, it's so easily easy to lose sight of how good the major league players are it just becomes normalized in your mind that of course that's the way it is but you know if you watch like I remember the game at Henry Ford Community College and I could see them thinking about the plays they were trying to make it wasn't yet muscle memory that right. they were trying to figure out how to do it and to get the repetitions in so it so it would be so yeah i agree with heidi that was all fascinating and for me that summer was just heaven it it, it brought me back to why i love baseball and, and now, did either of you play baseball when you were growing up I played till I was about 14 until it got to be serious and then I stopped. No. Were you any good? No, not really. <laughs> not really. Um, in the book, it certainly was evident that you met some very interesting people, a very cross, a broad cross section of people. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of those more interesting characters. 
Well, I listened in to a lot of conversations, mm-hmm. so I'm not sure I really necessarily <laughs> met many people, but I sure watched people. I probably watched people in the crowds maybe as much, maybe even more. Um, I loved the parents. Um, I thought they were really interesting. And the parents, some, you know, the ones who are watching their own child, but I was really interested in there were two two dads um, at different games. I think one was a dad, I'm not sure, with their with their little kid trying to teach them about the game and how special that was and it I mean some of those um I can't I I can't read some of the sections because I know it just makes me cry because they're just so lovely watching these you know dads and there was a dad in Detroit and his little girl and a, a, a dad at um Mal, Malton mm-hmm. Malton Park and in this little little mm-hmm. guy and it just really lovely and then I loved the mums and the grandmothers they were so awesome there's a couple of grandmothers that i just really really liked um cheering on their kids and that was really nice to see was there any of the opposite you know um i know certainly in in uh, you know you have hockey parents where they're yelling and screaming i was actually surprised at how little we saw of Hmm. that at the high school and and under 18 games or even the ncaa games there really was only the one incident that was at a high school playoff game where uh, the umpire stopped the game and kicked a fan out, one of the, presumably a father, I don't know, mm. and said, we're not playing anymore until he leaves the park. But that was the only instance in the whole time. And we were talking about where uh, young people start and then end up in, in the, the big leagues. And uh, I don't know if you saw this. I did. I yeah. did. Yes, <laughs> this young man who uh, from Windsor. Yep. Um, Jacob Robson uh, from T-Ball to the Tigers. Yep. Pretty. Um, do these stories have a different uh, resonance for you now that you've had that incredible experience of that summer? And meet and seeing these young people when they, you know, at the beginning and then, you know, at yeah, the Tigers. They mm-hmm. do for me because I've followed some of the players we watched, especially in in NCAA, and seen them get drafted and have wow. started to watch the progression of their careers as they move towards the majors. And you know, I especially think of Tommy Parsons, who plays for played for Adrian College, and you know, Division three players never get drafted. Uh, but he made the uh, minor league system for the Cardinals, and he's in their AAA team. And uh, it's been fun to follow him and some of the Michigan players who were drafted, and and seeing uh, young players like Noah Richardson going off to college in the states, Northern Kentucky, and he's a player for me that kept propping up again and again. We saw I saw him play. For high school and his under 18 team and and saw him in the stands and we had a lot of those characters who sort of came back up over and over again especially around windsor essex what was your when you think about from the the day when you made that decision until you know you closed the book Mm -hmm. what was your favorite experience when when you're you're telling somebody about it what do you want to talk about Mostly. I think we probably have the same moment, which is the Sarnia game, yeah. which was our uh, 26th game. And this was, ex- it was exhausting, this whole process. I mean, it was really, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I often say we we're, were working full time, so we'd come home and do this sort of in our spare time. So it, it was a lot. Um, but that Sarnia game, that's the song actually that Chrissy she is doing the did the song about and her first line which was i guess my first line is like neither of us wants to get in the car and drive to sarnia but it was so beautiful and once we hit just got off the 401 and started heading up towards sarnia the sun was just golden and the fields were beautiful Mm -hmm. and the everything just sort of melted away and we were there and it was just one of the most magical baseball games and then we're driving home and I think oh, we are so lucky to be doing this project and I think that was a real turning point it was it was the 4th of July and it was a beautiful summer night and the fireworks later on are going off across the river because we're in Sarnia and at that time there 
It was right before they rebuilt their ballpark, so it was very minimal. There were only about 10 people there. And it's like it was like the players were playing for us. So yeah, that was pretty magical. And it was one of those moments where I thought, if we weren't doing this project, we would have missed that. And it was such a beautiful, beautiful night. And um, I think it's probably one of my favorite games, not only of the, the year, but maybe our baseball watching career. So yeah. uh, we felt really lucky to uh, have this project to make us go to these things. Now, I want to get you to each read a piece, but um, I'll, I'll do that after we come back from a piece of music. And of course, you heard all kinds of music um, on your journey. And uh, I've been told that the band that Dale and Heidi heard most at the ballpark that summer was ACDC. And Neil Diamond's Sweet Caroline was also a very popular ballpark tune. But here's a song um, Heidi referred to specifically about baseball from a local artist. Singer-songwriter Chrissy Cochran wrote The Game for Dale and Heidi. Ironically, even though Chrissy has never even watched a baseball game, her song manages to evoke those wonderful images of Heidi and Dale's relationship to the game. Here it is. Neither of us wants to get in the car Make a long drive on a summer night With tomorrow morning looming all too soon But the road gives way to farmland And I realize there is nowhere That I would rather be than here with you trees that ring the outfield, the last sunlight of the day. It feels like this was made for us, the beauty of the play. You smile between the pitches, and I know you feel the same. There's nothing between you and me and the game. It's as quiet as a sermon Birds are singing in the trees Every soul is focused on the field The rituals of baseball Replacing all the chaos Just trying to believe a dream is real and I can feel the evening lifting all our cares away Feel this world whisper that things will be okay You smile between the pitches and I know you feel the same There's nothing between you and me and the game Evening turns to twilight I see this thing so clear Watching baseball with the one I love I am simply here You smile between the pitches And I know you feel the same there's nothing between you and me and the game. There's nothing between you and me and the game. Well, that was Chrissy Cochran, uh, who will be joining us on our next episode here on Scribes and Songsters. Wonderful song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's lovely. Yep. So what made you think of getting a song written? Well, it was Dale's birthday, and it was right in the middle of the pandemic. And his birthday was in July. And I thought, well, I should do something special. And I knew that Chrissy wrote songs for different occasions. So yeah. I sent her a note, and I said, would you mind writing something from this book? And so I gave her a couple chapters, and she picked 
the one from Sarnia, which I was really happy. Wow. With. Bet you and got then, goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, and I just, I can't, um, I, I just can't uh, express how I just was so overwhelmed when I heard it. And I think she sent it a couple weeks before Dale's birthday, so I had to wait. And it was just very agonizing. So, uh, but um, yeah, it's funny at her, um, when she launched her video, she was talking about how interesting it is to see and exciting to see someone else take her words and or her song and do something with it, make that beautiful video that she's got. And I was thinking, yeah, Chrissy, that's what happened when, you know, you yeah. took my, my words and put them into this beautiful song. So, uh, And yeah. speaking of your words, would you like to read um, a piece that we chose? Sure. Yeah. Um, this is, It's funny that you would choose this because... Uh, this is probably the most miserable I was in the whole game. It was, I think, it was a game three or something of two. The whole, game two of the whole thing, and it was uh, just to set it up. We are in um, Henry Ford Community College versus Macomb Community College in Taylor, Michigan, and the game time temperature was forty eight degrees. And <laughs> interestingly, uh, the team from Taylor, Michigan, won the Little League World Series this year. Oh, I know. I watched it. They, and so it was we amazing. were at the park that those kids clearly played in. Yeah. So wow. Yeah, brush with greatness. I guess, yes. But very cool. But but it was very cool. It was very cold. It was <laughs> rainy, and and like I said, it was the second second game. So I was really thinking, what have I got myself into? <laughs> so, um, all sort of. This is sort of mid. Actually, it's toward the end of the game. I think. Dale walks over to me and says. It's funny to see you here, soggy and watching baseball. I can concur, although funny may not be the word I would pick. I keep thinking about how we have 48 more games to watch, and I write 48 in my notebook and retrace the words with my pen until the raindrops blur my letters together. What have I got myself into? I begin to imagine a conversation that starts with, I need to back out of this project, but I stop myself. Scorecard mom, who is, I think there's at the time, four of us yeah. watching this game. Um, so we are half of the crowd. Scorecard mom pulls me out of my downward spiraling thoughts by yelling, come on, let's finish this so we can get out of the rain. And my ears perk up like the dogs. I'm not the only one cold and miserable and wanting to go home. I look at the field anew and the left fielder I notice is calling everything. Two more, two more, two more. Let's wrap this up. I look at the other people in the stands and realize everyone, including, I think, Dale, is cheering not for a victory or a comeback, for a finish, but for a finished game. And if I were the sort of person who yells in public, I'd be standing on top of this rain-soaked three-tiered, ble three-level bleacher yelling, get her done, get her done, like the guy behind me a few seasons ago at our Cincinnati Reds game. But I don't yell in public. Instead, I say, strike out, strike out, strike out in my head, willing the game to be over. Dale stands beside me and says, one more out and we can go home, maybe get some beer and some soup. And now I can't stop thinking about soup. <laughs> so that's that. that's, and uh, I, your voice, there are two voices in the book, yeah. and your voice seems to have that sort of narrative, descriptive um, piece to it. Yeah. And, and I'd like you to read the piece we chose for you, Dale. And you're very much the play-by-play -play guy. Yeah, uh, I'm surprised we never thought of it, but uh, the person from the Globe and Mail, that's how they described us, the the play-by-play -play and the color commentator. <laughs> and we saw that, and we went, oh, it's true, we it's never true, noticed that. But yeah. we should have should have got there. <laughs> uh, this is during the Division Three uh, tournament, which determined who would go to the College World Series at their level in Adrian, Michigan. Friday, May 18th, 2018, Marietta College Pioneers versus Wabash College Little Giants. Nicolet Field, Adrian, Michigan, game time temperature 63 degrees Fahrenheit. Though it's sunny and bright, the wind is cold as we make our way back into Nicolet Field for Wabash versus Marietta, the first of our two games today. Both are elimination games. Wabash, in their gray, red trimmed uniforms, take the field for the first inning. Cody Cochran, a right-handed senior is on the hill this morning for the Little Giants. He begins his motion facing third, hands at his belt, knees slightly bent. When he comes to the plate, it's straight over the top with little wasted motion, just a quick stride towards home. Simple but effective as he strikes out the first three Marietta hitters in the first two innings. 
strikes out three Marietta hitters in the first two innings. Sorry. He's not fast like LaRoche's Thomas or Adrian's Parson. He's more like Dittman from Wooster, but with more off-speed stuff, fooling the hitters rather than overpowering them. Jim Price, the radio color commentator for the Tigers, would almost certainly say that Cochran is using his whole arsenal and understands the art of pitching. This game is our fourth in 24 hours, an island of baseball I'm glad to inhabit. You'd think it would be hard to readjust to yet another new game, but by the time Cochran walks off the field at the end of the second, I've settled back in. It takes a couple of innings to get the feel of each game, to find the rhythm, but then everything except what's on the field melts away. It's lovely. So did you learn anything that you didn't know about yourselves? <laughs> yeah, I think probably sort of reading this book and seeing, you know, there are versions of ourselves in here too, but I, I think that um, there's a, a thread that runs through this book, which is me trying to be more like Dale watching baseball. And I don't think <laughs> Dale realized that I was trying yeah. to be more like him. And then I think finally I got, you know what? I just have to watch baseball like me. And so part of it's figuring out what what the other saw in a game and um mm -hmm. so i think you know reading each other's sections because we didn't share until um till we'd written them and then started putting them together and i think it was sort of interesting to see those two different voices emerging yeah. Yeah. um we've only got a, f a few seconds left but i want to know what project you're working on now are you working on a project Yes, I'm finishing a book about the 1934 Chatham Colored All-Stars baseball team. Um, and I mentioned them in the book a couple of times. So I'm working on that history of that. Yep. I, I saw that reference and we'll have to have you back once you sure. finish that. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Just delightful stories. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all for this episode of Scribes and Songsters, unfortunately. Many thanks to our guests, Heidi and Dale Jacobs. Their book, 100 Miles of Baseball, 50 Games One Summer, is available at Biblioasis. Thanks also to producer Liz Pettypiece Phillips, technical producer and editor Gary Glass, and consultant Brian Sweet. Grateful thanks to Tony Toldo and the Toldo Foundation, and to Neil and Tina Queering for their support. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you soon right back here on Scribes and Songsters. I'm Veronique Mandel. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.